Thank you very much. Um, I'm very proud that uh, West Point was able to sponsor this event and also proud to moderate um, as the daughter of a mayor uh, who served back in the 50s and 60s. I know well the dedication and the sacrifices that your families make to allow you to do what you do. So I'm very, very proud to moderate this this afternoon. Uh, as you know, and as you can see, we have five mayors. We'll start at this end with His Worship Mayor Rick de Crest from Brandon. He was born and raised in Brandon's East End. He was elected as 32nd mayor of the city in 2014. He has served uh, three terms on city council from 1995 to 2006, with eight of those years as deputy mayor. Uh, currently, he sits on several boards and committees, uh, including the Area Planning District Board and the Downtown Renaissance Brandon Board. Next to him, we have His Worship Mayor Martin Harvey from Winkler, first elected in 2006, and he is seeking a fourth term in office. Uh, during the 12 years he has served, he has seen the city expand rapidly. Since beginning his tenure, he has seen a 25% population growth and his budget double. Uh, Mayor Harder also serves on the Affordable Housing Committee. Next to him is Worship Randy Warwick, Mayor of Gimli. Uh, he was elected as Mayor in Gimli in 2014, also seeking re-election. He's also served as school trustee and was the Mayor of the set Manitoba. His council uh, portfolio is public safety. And in addition to a variety of community awards and committees, he's also chair of the Gimli Community Development Corporation. Next to him, His Worship Mayor Larry Johansson from Selkirk. He was first elected in 2006. After serving one term as a councillor, he became the mayor in 2010 and was re-elected in 2014. Like most mayors, he also serves on numerous boards and committees. Currently, he sits on the North Red Waterway Maintenance Board, Southwark and District Planning Area Board, Lake Friendly Board, Transit Committee, and the Downtown Sustainability Committee. There's probably more to all his bits and committees that they serve. Uh, last, but of course not least, uh, his Worship Mayor Chris Gerson from Steinbeck. Mayor Gerson was first elected as councillor for the city of Steinbeck in 2002 and was elected as mayor in 2006. He serves as the chair of the Strategic, Strategic Priorities Committee for Steinbach and is the president of the Steinbach Community Development. Most recently, he was elected to be executive of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities to represent Canada's 18 provincial and territorial municipal associations. Welcome to you all. understands housing to be the cornerstone of healthy individuals, families, and communities. We also know from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities that a stable and secure housing market <coughs> is essential to community and economic growth. Our mayors today will share some of the challenges that their communities face in ensuring that housing provision is affordable and sustainable. We also hope that they will share some of their celebrations and ideas that have worked in their jurisdictions in terms of ensuring their communities most vulnerable have access to the housing that they need. Earlier, uh, our keynote speaker for the conference, Tristan Higgins, he spoke uh, about the connections between urban design, happy homes, and happy communities. For cities across Canada hoping to attract newcomers to retain young families or to support older residents, to stay in their homes, affordable housing is essential. My first questions are this. What are the economic and growth strategies of your municipalities and how does housing fit into these strategies? Okay. There we go. 
So, welcome everybody back to the second show. I'm going to tell the rest of the uh, mayors here, I had the privilege of coming uh, earlier today to bring uh, greetings uh, to, the, uh, to the gathering today. And they, they had this uh, system where you could, I think it was by text, they could uh, indicate what they're, what they're most hoping, uh, looking forward to as part of the convention. And it was, uh, various sessions were mentioned, the food was mentioned, the mayor's session, and before I got up, well, as we were trending dead last, like the, the, the food was actually ahead of us, but I did put on a little bit of a sales pitch. I did emphasize that uh, this particular session was going to include wine and cheese, and so by the time I sat down, we were at least tied with the food, so I'm not sure how we, uh, how we uh, made out as the day went on. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Coral, uh, for introducing us all and for uh, being a sponsor as well. And, uh, uh, once again, welcome uh, to everybody in the audience and uh, certainly to uh, all of my uh, fellow mayors. And just so that uh, you don't think we're all as uh, magnanimous, there's only uh, two people, I think, at the table who are actually seeking re-election. Uh, Mayor Gertzen uh, had the wisdom to uh, uh, leave this madness and he's uh, retiring from uh, municipal uh, service at the moment. Both uh, myself and Mayor Harder were acclaimed. Uh, so uh, we actually have two who are the most dedicated and taking times away from their candidates as far as I know. Uh, in Brandon, uh, certainly we have a very, I guess you'd say, broad and complex uh, uh, growth strategy. Uh, we're 50,000 uh, people uh, at the moment, certainly as you know, second largest city uh, in, the, in the province and so certainly Provision of housing at, at every juncture is an extremely important uh, aspect, uh, you know, both from the standpoint of market housing, but it, uh, for uh, affordable housing as well. And I would say that for municipalities, we're in the sometimes the most precarious situation, where the sort of the lowest rung on the on the legislative ladder, we're creatures of the province, we're probably creatures of the. Uh, Federal government uh, uh, per se, we tend to have the you know the least amount of taxing authority, and uh, we, we basically have typically one card to play. That tends to be property taxes and uh, maybe a few other fees and and uh, and the like. And uh, so we we have at times the, the least amount of uh, resources, and yet we're sort of closest to the ground. So we're we're uh, trying to interface with the senior levels of government, and in, in my view. The, the, uh, the non-profit sector, particularly in, in our in my own municipality, and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the other uh, mayors are going to echo this as well. You know, we, we've had the most success with uh, engaging with other uh, organizations and the provincial government and the federal government to um, um, uh, start to make some gains with respect to uh, uh, affordable housing and uh, non-profit uh, housing. Probably a little later I'll get to be able to get into some specific examples. But in addition to that, we've also tried to certainly keep our taxes in line, which you know, makes the, the property taxes uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, living in, in any kind of dwelling, you know, certainly more affordable. So that's certainly a focus of our council. And we've also spent a, a considerable amount of time on some of the zoning strategies that have helped to allow for infill housing. We've certainly freed up uh, property where we can. Anytime we found some surplus housing, we put that up, uh, made it available at, at no cost. We've put up uh, uh, an RFP for towards the uh, nonprofit sector that we're capable of, of stepping up and using the, uh, the surplus land for affordable housing. We've had some success in that. But uh, certainly, it's been a, a many-pronged approach, and uh, you know, I firmly believe that uh, that is the the answer in terms of uh, coordinating and, and uh, just advocating with the senior levels of government, nonprofit organizations, private private sector uh, developers that are prepared to at least make changes and find ways to built more affordably, and uh, I'll probably talk about some sport, more specific examples uh, a bit later. Good afternoon. It's good to be here to share some of the things that are going on in Winkler. Uh, 
Uh, one of the things that uh, I have a little bit of a struggle with is what is affordable housing? And technically, it, as, a, as an equation would be what's your earning potential versus what's your ability to pay for, for your home. So whether if your earning potential is greater, obviously your affordability is greater than somebody who doesn't have the earning potential. So what are we doing in order to address this situation? We just finished a, uh, Winker Foundation did a survey, it's called Vital Signs, it's a nationally recognized uh, uh, process in order to determine what the, what the temperature of the, of the community is like. And affordable housing certainly was one of the issues that was being addressed. And yes, we recognize that there is a shortage of affordable housing. However, when I look at the salary levels that the city of Winker did, I, I have to admit it, we have been known to be a under average payer in, in not only the region, but the province and, and in Canada. But when I saw the salary levels, the average salary levels have gone up drastically, and the housing cost has really not gone up that drastically. We have uh, uh, community owned affordable housing. Our development strategy includes uh, allowing private companies in order to, or private developers in order to uh, add affordable housing to their units. We've allowed lot sizes to be narrowed up to make it more affordable and trying to limit the type of homes that are, that are designated as affordable homes so that they still fit into the community. So it's, it's been a kind of a three-pronged effort to make sure that uh, and we have a selection of housing available. One of the problems that we've faced with, because we are also uh, extremely involved with immigration, and for quite some time the immigration the population that moved in required three, four, five bedroom homes. And so therefore the affordability wasn't quite there. So we've made huge adjustments as far as what we're expecting from the private trade, added some, uh, some housing of our own, but I think the biggest thing that we did is we are the managers of all the managed by housing, affordable housing in Winkler today. We were on a pilot project a year ago, and it's transitioned into a group called Central Station that is now managing it, and two of our key people are here. And uh, affordable housing is a component of a social accountability as well, and so that's where that uh, fits in. And one of the neat things that I found out there is they've actually been invited to go to those places for coffee in order to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. So the province of Manitoba is no longer managing the affordable housing that they have in Winkler. It is now done by a local organization and they are able to provide services much more than simply rent. They're able to help them to manage their finances, help them managing their ability to cook, provide food services, provide uh, special needs. So it's, uh, it's been a great uh, asset to the community and that's kind of the approach we've taken. Well, good afternoon, everybody. I want to send out my appreciation to being invited here. I, uh, this is the first conference I've attended and uh, just in the day I've been here through the networking, I've learned a lot. Uh, but just to put, so you can put me in a perspective, I was a Ukrainian game warden that won an election in an Icelandic commercial fishing town. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought that was kind of neat. But anyways, for those of you that don't know Gimli, we have, we have a number of challenges. Like I've said before, we're the oldest community in the province, third oldest in the country. Our basic economic driver is tourism. 54% of our population does not live full-time within the RM, basically summer homes. So that, and then StatsCan has also said uh, through their, the last um, census is that we have a large population of uh, people that require affordable housing. And for those of you that have dealt with seniors, I deal with a lot of seniors, <coughs> they don't like to pay taxes. <laughs> Not at all. And the, the school tax thing comes up regularly and it's a, it's a real problem. And the developers have decided they're, they're building large single-family homes on large lots outside of town. Uh, presently, there's 600 lots for sale in the arm of Gimli. And most of those houses 
are in excess of 250 to 300,000. Uh, the subdivision just north of me, uh, entry level there is around 450. But yet, because we're a tourist town, as you can, as Mayor Harder said, wages are not high. Uh, in fact, uh, most people in our town, according to StatsCan, are just making minimum wage. So you can appreciate the fact it's tough for these young families. And we are trying to, and the growth of our community, and when I, just to give you, when I saw that 54% just after I got elected, thought something has to change here. Because for one thing, the agenda is being driven by people that don't live there full time. So it, it's difficult to do development because they can, they can stop it. But we decided to take the tap we're going to go forward anyways. So we started working with business, our industrial park. We've got a fish plant opening up soon that's going to have 50 uh, employees. Uh, we're talking with a major uh, company uh, in Canada. They're looking at relocating to Gimli. And that's going to provide up to 100 jobs. But we don't have the afford we don't have housing. And um, just uh, two weeks ago, we were at a public hearing where we have an individual coming up to build um, a trailer park in town. And he's part of this national housing strategy. And that's something that we're gearing towards. Because the growth of our community, and, and when I was running for real I was running for election four years ago, the question came up: are we a tourist town or are we a seniors town? But nobody said there's something in the middle. So my, my focus for the last four years is let's find that, that middle ground. And uh, we have. Um, we're starting to look at more affordable housing options. Uh, I've got some great ideas from here. I, you know, I've thought about co-op housing and we've talked about uh, that. It's just that we have to move the developer's mind. And I, there was a comment I made earlier and I kind of prop it was a dirty word. But to me, to bring affordable housing to our communities, we've got to start looking at strategies that are a little different. Because people are finding, if, especially in a community like Gimli, when you're, most of your people are making minimum wage, you cannot afford a $200,000 house. But we're working towards that. We are, we are slowly doing it, and I hope I get reelected so I can finish off when I start. So thank you. Well, you've certainly got my vote. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. He's one of the ice slappers. <laughs> I have a, had a summer cottage on Gimli Road for many, many years, so it's a beautiful area. Uh, Larry Johansson, Mayor of City of Selkirk. Uh, <clears throat> I guess I want to start out with, I've left a handout at each table, uh, and when I started in this political game 12 years ago, uh, I always go by the top four wants and the top four that I've worked on is strong infrastructure, recreation, these are things that people want to see in a community, safety, and above all affordable housing. And we've worked hard with developers to bring affordable housing to the city of Selkirk. Um, I believe that uh, you know we, we, we talk about what we want in our communities but I've never been a believer in, in uh, barbershop politics or coffee shop politics. Uh, that's why I ran 12 years ago, is to get involved and to make a change. Uh, the, the, what I've handed out to you is, uh, is what I think is affordable housing. Uh, we're in the process now of working with uh, one developer called Meso Homes. Um, we, we've taken a, a, a whole blocks, a whole city block and uh, this is a first of its kind. We've uh, developed 750 square foot housing on it, and it's under $200,000. Uh, we put the first house up, used it as a show home, and sold out the rest of the box, 16 homes within two weeks. So we're working on 100 acres right now in the city of Salker. Um, you won't see any million dollar homes in there, uh, we're halfway through the development agreement. It's going to take up to a year to do, but we're going to have a wide array of housing in there. We're going to have multi-use housing. We're going to have triplexes, duplexes. We're going to have some of these meso homes. And a free press article, which I included in that handout, high quality homes can be affordable. So that speaks for itself. Uh, also, we're working with the, our indigenous partners. I've also included a Manitoba Métis Foundation. Uh, they've built the first of many. First two homes went up uh, and opened not too long ago. 521 Dufferin Avenue in Selkirk, Manitoba. Three bedrooms, $1,000 a month. 
grass cut for you, snow shovel for you. Four bedrooms, $1,065 a month. Truly affordable homes. So we're gonna, we're gonna sit down with our partners, we're gonna sit down with investors, developers, and we're gonna make sure that there won't be any million dollar homes on this 100 acres, because I firmly believe in 20 years, there's not gonna be anybody, anybody, that wants to live in a million dollar home on a huge, huge lot. I know the people that are coming up behind us now, they don't want landlines. Half of them don't want cars. They want to just be able to live in a home, work, and go when they want to go. So I'm a firm believer in a thousand square feet. Uh, we've, we've created the first in Selkirk where we're not having 50 foot minimum frontage lots. We've gone, when I became mayor, we went to 33 foot frontage lots. And they, we've had the, the most housing starts ever in the history of soccer. We have the highest census ever in the history of soccer. And we have developers north of our, our center of town, north of Manitoba Avenue. They've taken dilapidated homes on a 100 foot frontage lot. They've torn that home down and they've built three homes. And each of those homes can be an option of 800 square feet up to 2,400 square feet, all on a 33-foot frontage lot. And the way we do it is if they want to just have one floor developed, a bungalow, it's 800 square feet. If they want to develop the basement and the main floor, they've got 1,600 square feet. If they want to put a two-story and develop all three floors on that same 33 frontage lot, foot frontage lot, they have 2,400 square feet. This has led to affordability. This has led to people's uh, hydro bills, uh, lowered enough to probably pay for more than half the mortgage payment on these brand new houses because you have complete energy efficiency, the best windows, built to the highest code, built to the standard. So, I've got, to, I've got to say I'm very, very proud of what our administration, what our council, uh, what we've done uh, in the last dozen years. So we're moving ahead on affordable housing. You can tell who's running for election, eh? <laughs> <laughs> and you can he was also... supposed to hold up my sign while I was speaking, but he forgot. <laughs> and you can also tell that uh, every mayor on this panel is very proud of their community, and that's what we are. We are proud of our communities, and and we work hard to make things good and right for our uh, citizens. And that includes all citizens, not the ones that just have cash, but the ones that are looking to contribute uh, in their own way and their, with their own abilities. You know, uh, as the mayor of the city of Steinbeck, uh, now it's my turn to toot my horn, eh? Or our horn. <laughs> we are the third largest city uh, in Manitoba. We're the fastest census, uh, growing census agglomeration in all of Manitoba as well as, uh, certainly, I think it's the third or fourth in Canada, this last uh, census. So it's been really substantial growth. And uh, uh, over the last 12 years as mayor, we've seen about 56% increase in population. Now, for many communities, a 56% increase in population over just over a decade can be a real challenge when it comes to affordability and ex access to housing. We are slightly different than that. I'm not saying we don't have an affordability issue. We do, but it's different. We have had developers step up to the plate uh, big time in a variety of ways. We have had not-for-profit not, uh, uh, organizations step up in uh, substantial ways to make sure that they're covering the bases. Uh, we have had uh, a whole variety of changes take place within our zoning bylaws to allow for creativity and flexibility when it comes to housing in our communities. The question that we were asked was about our economic strategy and one of the things that Steinbach and, and, and not just Steinbach but others on this panel as well have in their community is diversity. Diversity is the key to the success in our community. A diversity in economy, a diversity in type of housing, and a diversity in certainly the type of people you have in your community, and that's been a real success for us in Steinbach. And uh, when it comes to housing in particular, uh, we've seen a wide variety of housing built, starting with secondary suites. Secondary suites is a, a major way that you can actually fairly easily and quickly 
make major changes and major improvements to affordability in your community. Uh, we've had some of the, uh, the most uh, uh, non-stringent uh, regulations when it comes to secondary suites, and we have probably one in ten, I'm estimating, uh, one in ten uh, homes that actually has a secondary suite. That's a significant amount of people who are able to lower their own rent and also accommodate someone else who needs some, some affordability. Uh, the other aspect that uh, I want to get into before we move on to some of the other questions is just when it comes to jobs and making sure that we have adequate jobs in our, in our community and availability of jobs in our community. And so we've made a, a strategic effort to not only keep our uh, taxes low, which we have, but keep our services high and making sure that people understand clearly that our biggest asset is our people that we have and our workers that we have in our community. And so we've made sure that we are uh, seen as open for business and that if people have jobs, their place very quickly becomes more affordable. Thank you. Thank you. said about the strategy and the key role that they play in housing provision. Um, many municipalities have been working to increase and preserve the supply of rental and affordable housing in their jurisdictions. I can say it, jurisdictions. Um, if you could describe uh, specific measures that your municipality has taken to improve <coughs> access to housing, of course, particularly affordable non-profits. Well, I'm not sure um, whether I've got um, a lot to add to the, the previous question. I do have some specific uh, measures that may try to answer some of the upcoming, so I'll just maybe pass along sure. and give a little concern time. The uh, National Housing Strategy, I made a comment about it before we, we had some ideas we wanted to get into the National Housing Strategy and get some funds from there. The majority of it is obviously for loans, and so it makes it a little bit more difficult if you're still needing more money. However, one of the things that we're hoping to do in this whole transition with the Manitoba Housing Project in Winkler is that eventually uh, we will apply for an upgrade on those Manitoba housing units in Winkler in order to be able to uh, get them livable. And I will just share a few examples of the deplorable condition of Manitoba housing units. We have uh, some of them that, that haven't been occupied for two or three years. They were totally renovated and uh, trashed, and of course there was no money to repair them. We have one unit that has 11 units in it, of which six of them are unoccupiable. Only five are occupied, and they've been empty for the last two years. So when we're talking about affordable housing, we need to put our really we need to put our shoulder where we want to invest our money. We believe that we can do it wisely by bringing them up to a standard that is in fact livable, and that we will do a better job of maintaining them on a local level than what province of Manitoba has done in the past. So that's the direction we're going with that. We believe that it has merit, and we believe that we can add further affordable housing that is also going to be owned by the, we have an we organization that we've set up is the, uh, it, it's, it's called the Winkler Housing Authority. We've changed it now to a Canada Regional Housing uh, Initiative. Gibley has a real problem with rental housing, but um, three things I've been working on now is uh, Hamer Best, it's an organization that deals with um, adults with disabilities. Um, the municipality donated a large parcel of land to them. They're going to be building their fifth group home there. Um, also, I'm the vice president of Sacred Heart to Korean Catholic Church. We own a house right next to we are, we're the cheapest rent in town. We charge Hamer Best $800 a month. And um, you can't even touch a house in Gimli for under 1000 So, But that's on the personal side. 
Uh, we're also working with the province about uh, with a 40 unit, 55 plus subsidized. That's tenders in December, I hope. <laughs> that's coming up. And uh, we're also working with a developer just within the last month or so. Um, and he's accessing money through the National Housing Strategy to make a development that will be affordable uh, mobile home park. But we, we, need, we do struggle with affordable housing. What's, what's interesting though is Airbnb is taking over a lot. As you can appreciate with so many um, summer homes, and what we've seen is the trend is uh, to go Airbnb now. And even we're seeing people that uh, aren't even showing up in Gimli anymore and just renting on short-term basis. But we have to find a way to bring it back to, so that the people who can least afford a large sum of money can start renting in town. because. When I first became mayor, one of the one of the things that I was made aware of quite quick, and it was like the chicken and the egg, we had employers coming to town and saying, "We'd like to set up shop here, but your housing is too expensive. So, like, who do you bring in first? So now my goal is to bring in the housing, and then the employers are going to follow on. I think we. Uh in Selkirk, we, we have a high percentage of uh, provincial housing, and we always have had, uh, we have strong, uh, strong NDP government for, uh, for 20 years, and uh, good representation, and, and we built a fair share of provincial housing. I think the key is to work with the developers. I know our neighbors to the south of us, that big capital city, one of the, uh, I don't believe that going about things the right way. Um, when, when you go and you build 500 homes in a lot, in a field, and you, you build it and you call it a new subdivision and you, you pat yourselves on the back and you say what a great job you're doing. That's not growth. Um, when you build homes that are half a million dollars plus and you build them in an area where there's no culture, there's no history to the area, I just don't believe that's progress. Um, when I was in Whistler, on a sustainable communities uh, conference, I talked to councillors out there, and uh, they had it right years ago. Um, they realized that electricians that perhaps built a home 25, 30 years ago in Whistler, and now they're going to retire, well, they put the home that they built for $50,000 on the market, and they ask a million dollars for that home. Well, it's not another electrician that can come along and afford that home. So the wise men that they were, they realized many, many years ago that if you want people to work the golf courses in Whistler, if you want people to work the ski slopes, if you want them to work in the shops in Whistler, you better have affordable housing. So they worked with developers. And when a developer came along and said he wanted to build multi-million dollar homes that only movie stars and sports stars could afford, they recommended and in the development agreements that they made with those developers, they enforced that they also built affordable housing. So we've, I brought that back to City of Selkirk, and, and while we're not doing it on the same scale as Whistler, we're using that pretense when we go forward with developers and when we expand, we want to make sure that we have the people that can afford the houses and the people that can afford to live in Selkirk. So it's very, very important to, to us to work with developers to ensure that that happens. When it comes to affordability, and uh, the question was specific measures that were taken or have been taken or are being taken, I think we have to look at it in twofold. And, and uh, us as uh, City of Steinbeck, we've looked at it uh, not only from the rental aspect, but also from the home ownership aspect. And those are two probably different ways to go about it. With the rental aspect, uh, making sure that there are adequate amounts of rentals so that the price remains in the market, uh, continues to make sure that the price remains affordable. Uh, we've been very aggressive in approving multifamily, additional multifamily in our community. Uh, we've also changed our infill policies so that we have added and encouraged infill in our downtown area with multifamily where we increase density and then thus increase affordability. The other aspect when it comes to uh, affordability and multifamily is making sure that your not-for-profits are engaged. And when they see a uh, need, such as 
with people with uh, uh, either uh, mental disabilities or uh, mental health challenges that uh, those uh, type of special programs do get addressed and acknowledged. And we as a city have, have done that over the years. I know we worked with Eaton East, uh, making sure that uh, uh, there was some dollars put towards each door so that that could be more of, a, of an affordable project. Uh, we've put dollars towards seniors housing when it comes to uh, forgiving of the development fees uh, or giving them back at the end. Uh, we've done some of that just to make it slightly more affordable uh, when it comes to the building and the, uh, and the ongoing costs for uh, maintaining those projects. When it comes to the aspect of affordability and home ownership, uh, there we really relied on developers to be creative. And I know about 10 years ago we had a developer come to us and say they wanted to create an area that had, had affordability. There were, at that time, about $120,000, $121,000 per home, uh, and those, but they made a condition. We, we would forgive their development fees uh, if uh, they sold them for exactly those amounts, and the people stayed in their homes for a, a minimum of three years. Uh, that happened, and it was a huge success. Now those people have moved on, and they've, they've made things work, they've built equity, and now they're moving on to other, other subdivisions and other parts of the community. Uh, we've also now seen a, uh, a morphing of that type of a pro program where now we see we didn't have to step in. We had to make sure that there was adequate zoning uh, for, uh, for small lots and affordable housing. But uh, a developer has now, in fact there's a, a number of them that are doing it now, where they are actually uh, saying 1% down and we will build you a house. We'll cover the other 14% as long as you stay there. But it's they, they they're taking the risk. Huge benefit to this community. We're having uh, probably uh, an extra 100 homes built every year in a small community of 16, 17,000 people. Really significant, and these are homes in the $200,000 range, uh, give or take, and uh, <coughs> we're seeing the developers really step up as well, uh, making it happen. And so you looking at it at those two fronts, those are some of the uh, uh, initiatives that are taking place at this time and in the past. Thank you. Uh, as we are all aware, the National Housing Strategy has been released. Um, while the province is still negotiating with the federal government on some aspects of funding coming to Manitoba, the co-investment fund allows for municipal contributions to be recognized. This question has three parts. Are there things that you have done as a municipality to prepare your partner or to prepare to partner with the National Housing Strategy. What has your reaction to the strategy been? And third, how do you think it will impact affordable housing in your community over its 10-year implementation? All right, that is a, that is a mouthful. So um, uh, certainly um, not just for the uh, National Housing Strategy, but I guess housing in general. City of Brandon has uh, created and maintained a, a, a housing reserve so that we have funds available to partner um, with either nonprofit organizations to support their uh, efforts. And we've had some you know, great uh, success and great projects uh, there. Uh, again, I'm going to list some of these in a few minutes here. Um, also, in the event that one of the senior levels of government have a program available, then we're, we're I guess a little more fleet of foot to be able to respond if it's uh, this reserve that we have. We also partnered with uh, another local organization, the Brandon Neighborhood Renewal Corporation, that does play a significant role in, in the housing continuum and the renovation portion of housing, uh, supporting people uh, in helping to get started with housing. So rather than have our own housing coordinator, we, uh, Affordable Housing Coordinator, I should say, we contracted with the uh, with the BNRC to utilize one of their people uh, to also serve as the city's housing coordinator. So it, it sort of worked well, in my opinion, for both organizations because it uh, gave uh, BNRC, you know, probably a little more horsepower and it provided a probably a, a more skilled coordinator in the housing area. Uh, to the city than, than we might have found 
on our own. So that was another, uh, I think, a, a good um, feature of our housing strategy, if you will. And you know, as the uh, programs begin to roll out, um, I think it was stated this morning. The, the uh, deputy minister speaking this morning indicated they're <coughs> currently negotiating the, the bilateral bilateral agreement between Manitoba and the federal government on the on the national housing strategy. So once that is set, I think that is obviously going to give every um, buddy in the housing business, all of you in the room, including the municipalities, more direction on on uh, what's available and. and what directions we can go uh, with respect to <coughs> housing. As I'd indicated, and some other mayors have indicated as well, we've also <coughs> made some zoning changes that, um, you know, I think it was uh, uh, Larry had indicated, or maybe it was uh, Martin indicating, uh, a narrowing of, uh, of the possibility of uh, uh, the, the, the minimum uh, width of lots that you can uh, build on. So that's certainly, uh, uh, created some better opportunities and certainly created opportunities for infill housing uh, that didn't really require any, I guess, subsidy, if you will, but it certainly challenged the uh, ingenuity of developers. And some of the, uh, some of these were smaller developers, so it's kind of niche developments almost where they have uh, done a pretty good job of, of uh, responding to this <coughs> infill housing opportunity. Uh, to create ho housing that was a little more affordable, I would still call it market uh, housing, but certainly at a, at, a, at a price that people can uh, can uh, afford. Um, as I indicated, we've, we've uh, had the pleasure, I guess, as a, as a larger community of, of Brandon, we're lucky that we've got quite a number of, of uh, nonprofit organizations in, in the community. As I indicated, we've, we've had. Uh, 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 Great service from a, a seniors organization, the Brandon Seniors Housing Cooperative. They've done two major developments. The second of which I might have, I know I talked about their their program at uh, last year's uh, conference, and they opened their second uh, major complex uh, this summer. Uh, about 48, I think it was. Uh, 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 affordable housing units uh, for seniors, and about a dozen. Uh, market uh, housing. So they're, within that building, even they, they've uh, uh, done a creative way of, of having some market housing in there. They discovered they had certainly seniors that wanted to live within this very sort of active, I call it, community within a community inside the seniors uh, 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 complex. But they were not in need of affordable housing. They're they're. Uh, Incomes uh, or resources were beyond what uh, would qualify, but they would have liked to have been in the building. So the, the second phase, the second building they did, they included some market housing, so that these people that wanted to be uh, in the in the building, you know, primarily for the for the activities and the the, the great community they have, were able to uh, avail themselves. We've had good luck with Habitat for Humanity. Uh, I'd say that the city made a, a significant investment probably about 15 years ago and was on council the first time we donated a sizable tract of land to Habitat for Humanity. I think that in total we've uh, uh, contributed about 40 lots and about uh, 24 of them have built out, so about 16 more to go. So that was a good um, investment uh, that we had uh, made. We've had uh, uh, some good projects with uh, uh, Youth for Christ organization in Branham. We've had uh, good work with the Canadian Mental Health Association, the Branham Friendship Center, and some recent success. And I'm pretty sure that if I can just leave the deputy minister. Goodbye. Oh, <laughs> Thanks for coming. We'll see you again. I was just going to say some Hang on, the best is yet to come. You can take these ideas back to the ledge. Well, well at least you can, you can take them. Don't oh, go yet, partner. But you can at least take a bow from this next one. Uh, we, uh, nice guys, great, uh, take it out. We had a great success with the uh, with uh, Manitoba Housing on a, on a very recent uh, uh, Manitoba Home Buyers Assistance Program, and, and a total of, I think, 25 families qualified for assistance. Uh, I think uh, I got 5% uh, towards their down payment and closing costs, and uh, 
were suddenly made uh, the opportunity for 25 families. I think there were more that responded to the RFP, but uh, this is um, quite new. And in a part and parcel of that program, uh, these families uh, had to attend a mandatory training program on the on home buying, financing, and maintaining. Because we got to realize that maybe lots of us have uh, owned a home for quite a while, or maybe had some help from. Uh, uh, a parent or an uncle or grandpa or somebody helped us to get this figured out. Not everybody, especially uh, uh, new residents to Canada, it's a little more of a, a new territory. So this uh, training session, I thought that was a very uh, positive idea and uh, that, that was done and now we'll actually make their success in being able to um, you know, pull this off and maintain it uh, more successful. So that was a, a an exceedingly good uh, program. I want to compliment. Uh, that's why I wanted didn't want you to to, to uh, leave there, Jake. That, uh, for my view, of a modest amount of money, uh, kind of would go a long way to help these uh, first-time home buyers get started. And and uh, I think you know if you want to take back your minister. Uh, uh, Jay, that uh, I think that's kind of on the right track of, of uh, getting people started, and then of course it helped financial institutions, it helped some uh, you know uh, real estate people, and you know now there's renovations going on, it really ripples through the uh, economy. So uh, glad I he, he used to play for the Wheat Kings, so we know he can stick out the back, the back pedal. Thank you very much. Well, that's great, Rick. <laughs> I see Carol and Ryan is here as well, so I may as well add some accolades. Uh, about eight years ago, a concept uh, was developed in regards to a, a, an active living center, which includes some, some amount of housing units, uh, or supported by amount of housing units, and included some, some market uh, housing units. And so what we ended up building was a 72-unit uh, housing complex together with the senior center on the main floor in the seniors housing. But the Manitoba government came up to the plate and they contributed towards 48 of those units as affordable housing. So it's driven by market rent. And there's 24 units that are, that are sorry, they're, it's driven by uh, Manitoba housing rent guidelines. And there's 24 units that are driven by market rent. So the rent there's quite a bit more. But the services that are made available there have attracted where we're now, I think there's two units left, so it's basically full. But what it has done, it's freed up a lot of homes that are that are less expensive home for first-time home buyers to buy or to create rental properties. So very appreciative of that. But one of the things that we did as a city in order to get that done is we uh, we developed a downtown infield tax incentive program. So the taxes that uh, these residents are paying, uh, it is progressive over the course of five years, and so that people uh, actually, while it was being filled up, it wasn't quite as difficult for them to, to make it work. The other thing that we have done and are continuing to do is review our lot size, and the only difficulty that we have there is because we have the developers who are very quick to seize upon the opportunity to uh, generate more yield out of their property that they're developing. So uh, the lot size values have gone up significantly, even though the lot sizes have been reduced. So it's a bit of a challenge to make sure that it doesn't stay with the developer, but it actually gets passed on to, uh, to the, uh, the, the buyer or the people who are providing the, the affordable housing. <coughs> Going forward, I think one of the things that we have not done a great job of, and it sounds like you hit the nail on the head in Steinbeck in regards to the secondary suites. Uh, our uh, administration has always been very reluctant to add uh, secondary suites to homes, and parking is always an issue. And so we need to take another look at that and find out how we can develop that. But uh, affordable housing and actually my concept of affordable housing uh, is, uh, I've, I've looked at a co-op housing program where there's an incentive in order for them to stay at length in those housing units. I think it's going to save uh, 
support over the years because they're going to be able to learn how to transition into owning their own home and still gain some equity. So we're still working on that one. And the other one that we're working on right now is uh, I'm working with a regional group called Hamilton Valley Reeves and Mayors. There's 14 uh, members, uh, 14 municipalities represented, and together we're trying to figure out how best to approach affordable housing in the region. As I mentioned before, we're partnering with a proponent for the National Housing Strategy. And from what I learned today and the research I've been doing, it's something that uh, I can see, although there may be some issues, I think there's some there is something in this program that we could do affordable housing. Now, one of the things I forgot to mention is we've had a couple of inquiries about the tiny homes. And I know I've, I've been told it might be a fad and, and whatever. It's big in the United States. But I have to agree with what Larry said a little earlier. And statistics are starting to prove this out. Millennials and the succeeding generation from us do not want to do extensive yard work. <clears throat> they don't want a half acre of grass to cut. They don't want to snow blow a lot of snow. So I can see the size of those homes in the future are going to come down. And I think if we work with developers and start putting that message out because maybe they're not seeing the same statistics or the same research that we're seeing, going on a go forward basis into the next generation, tiny homes or smaller homes, a thousand feet, 800 square feet, might be the new norm. And I think this housing strategy is gonna help us get there. And when I, when I think of tiny homes, and I, I've read it's not for everybody, that's fine, but I bet you for most people in this room, we grew up in homes that were probably 900 square feet, if that. And then what happened? All of a sudden, there's 1,200, there's 13, there's 1,500. We have more space in our homes now than we've ever had before. Our children move away and they become empty. But our children don't want to do what we did. I, I have a half acre of grass to cut. I didn't know how long it took me to cut it until my two sons left home. <laughs> I also didn't realize how big my driveway was either. I guess that's why my oldest boy said, I said, why are you leaving home? He said, I want to get paid for the work I do. <laughs> but, I, but I look at, at, at the next generation and say, you're right. I, you know, it was a good point. They don't want to do what we did. So maybe now we can start looking at affordable housing and bring that $300,000 home and the mortgage rates down because we are in a bit of a housing bubble, I believe, and, and there's going to be something happening. And I think it's also our job as elected officials to try and protect what's out there, too. Well, I agree with Randy. Um, I also agree with a lot of things that the National Housing Strategy has put forward. Uh, it's got a lot of pluses, but it's got a lot of minuses, too. I think they're missing the boat on, uh, while interest rates are, are at an all-time low, what we have to do is we have to offer hard-working citizens a chance to lock in at a minimum of a decade. Uh, the people that are making the decisions, uh, and they're all up here also, uh, we're all well-heeled. And what happens a lot of times is we forget about the people that are out there working at a $15, $20 an hour job. We forget about those people that are trying to make ends meet. Uh, they're trying to get by. Uh, they may be living in Gimli, they may be living in Steinbach, Selkirk, uh, working in Winnipeg. Well, those people, when the price of gas goes up, when groceries go up, when the hydro goes up, and when their interest rates go up, things suffer. The kids suffer at the birthdays, the kids suffer at Christmas time. What we have to do is get these people into affordable homes, and I'm not talking about a $150,000 home that the heat is going right out the window, right through the roof, no insulation. They get into these homes and they, they, they can't even make the hydro payment, much less the monthly mortgage payment because the utility bills are through the roof. So you get a person, you get a family, if you can set their interest rate at a reasonable rate for 10 years so they know where they are, if you can get them into a new home that's energy efficient for around $200,000, you get them in that home, 
and they know where they're at. Their utility bills are going to pay for half that monthly mortgage payment easily. And what we have to do is we have to look after those hardworking Canadians and we have to get them into a home that they're going to be proud of, a home that they can afford. So I think the national housing strategy, we have to look at that at least a minimum of a decade at a fixed interest rate for these young, young hardworking families. Uh, I know in the city of Selkirk, our directors don't come to us until the tax increase is at 2.5 or lower. I don't believe in zero tax increases and I don't believe in 4 to 5 percent tax increases. 2.5 will, will almost cover inflation and that's where we need to be. Otherwise the city will suffer. The roads will suffer, there will be no storm sewer separation, infrastructure, weekends. You have to have that 2.4, 2.5 or lower. So if we can get the national housing strategy to get a decade of fixed rates for mortgages, if communities can keep the tax increases reasonable, and we can get these families in energy efficient homes that they not only will be proud of, but they'll want to stay in, and they'll want to stay in the community that those homes are in, I think we'd have a win-win situation. I think the key to success for the uh, national housing strategy is going to be some <coughs> flexibility. There are significant dollars over the next decade that are being uh, put towards uh, affordability and affordable uh, housing. And I think if there is enough flexibility built into the different programs and, and different aspects, you're going to see success. Because you have five communities up here and you have five slightly different approaches to affordability. And I think when you look at inside our communities, we have a multifaceted ways of solving the problem. It's not one size fits all. And I think if we see flexibility with the national housing strategy, and we see uh, an ability to think outside the, the norms of maybe where we've been or where we're heading, they're gonna see success. If we, can, if we are stringent and say, we don't want to see, uh, if you're outside these lines, it's not gonna work, it's going to be more difficult and it'll be less successful. So flexibility is going to be the key over the next decade, uh, and not only for us as municipalities, but for the strategy itself. And so that's going to be key uh, to certainly the success and the, the success of our citizens. I'll close with that. Thank you. Um, we all see housing um, as a critical issue throughout Manitoba. Uh, because of the work we do and the roles that we have. Um, we don't see it though uh, come up in, uh, as a major election issue in communities, at least not in the way that it has in Toronto or, or Vancouver. So the question is, is how would you like to see nonprofit housing providers working with <coughs> municipal governments either to promote affordable housing as an election issue or to work together on solutions post? So this is certainly a very timely question, although we're probably late in the election campaign, so it's going to be you know, any advice at the moment on how to get engaged in this election. Although I, I think that a bigger target will be at the senior levels, of, uh, and, and we will shortly have both federal and provincial elections coming up. A year from now will be the federal election, a year after that the next provincial election. So I would certainly encourage um, the, the nonprofit housing associations, uh, all of you, that uh, various forms that, that you have to to engage um, at that level, you know, including to continue at the municipal level. And in my view, I think that the and I'm only just going to speak for myself, uh, not even for my whole council, but I think the thing that um, where the where you get the most traction, in my view, would be presenting you know, the business case. And, uh, the, the, the projects that have succeeded that, the, that the, our city has partnered with and appears like the province has partnered with were those that, that were able to cobble out that plan. I get, uh, we get still others that come forward you know, and they, they have a great deal of passion but don't really have any kind of plan. 
and then it's really hard, sadly, to, to really grapple onto that to, for the rest of us. So, to the, and, and now it would occur to me, and that's why you have this conference, is that there, there's getting to be enough successful projects out there that you can borrow from one another. I mean, now the, 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 the sort of templates, if you were, are out there that you could utilize to, to be able to come up with a, I call it, you know, simply a business plan, but certainly your, your uh, plan of action in terms of, you know, what is it that uh, you want to build or what is it that you uh, want to occupy for housing and uh, what are the square footages, what are the uh, costs, what, are, you know, what do you need, what, what's the utilities going to be, what will the rents be and so on and so forth. You've got to have the, the full package and I, and I think that when, when organizations come forward that are, that are that organized, that is most likely to get the attention of any level of government. And uh, I, I would say at the senior levels, they're, they're looking for quicker wins. And, you know, sort of you hear the kind of the shovel ready and so on and so forth. So coming along with projects that are just sort of still a gleam in somebody's eye are going to be more difficult to, to uh, to get funded and and, uh, and the like, but now there's a there's enough successful projects in this province alone that you can uh, borrow from from each other, and you know we're certainly hearing a lot of uh, examples uh, here uh, as well. So that that would be my my you know kind of greatest sense of advice, and then you know just keeping the uh, the topic front and center. And I would agree that it has not been as big a uh, you know, when, I, when I ran for mayor the first time, affordable housing was a, a, a larger topic. And I would say that the election before that, it was maybe larger again still. And, and uh, so it surprisingly has not, uh, you know, we've got other things like we've got crystal meth that is a, uh, a big issue. And it's sad that that would push you off the front page. Uh, but, you know, we do have some you know, realities. But I, but I think you got to keep fanning the flames, and, and we've got to keep the uh, the topic of uh, housing and affordable housing and nonprofit housing uh, front and center in the uh, in the election conversations, and I would say more particularly at the uh, federal and provincial levels. Thank you, Chris. I think one of the things that we need to do is to remove the barriers that prevent opportunities of development, whether it is being flexible in the national housing strategy, whether it is how we develop communities, or uh, what type of homes we allow in our communities. A lot of the restrictions that we have are because whether it's building code, or whether it is uh, hoops that you have to go through, development fees is another one that we as municipalities can look at. How can we incentivize that so to make sure that uh, the housing is affordable, but yet at the same time, I said the same thing as before, where block reduction is size is certainly one of them, but be careful that we're not just giving the dollars over to the developer because they're quick to take it. We do have some developers who are very careful with that, others who just look for yield. So those are the challenges that we face as a municipality, but uh, I like the idea of, uh, of providing incentives for as long as it's sustainable, affordable housing, and not that you have to subsidize it all along because we all know that we're running out of subsidy money. Provincial government is, federal government is, so we need to have them self-sustainable. I ran as mayor four years ago. Uh, two of my platforms was affordable housing for seniors, which turned out it's gonna be, it's gonna, it's happened. Uh, we're getting that 40 unit uh, building done and also affordable housing for uh, young families. And we're also doing this one now. But I've also been accused of having a very large world view. I've never stopped advocating for affordable housing. But I, I, I kind of take it out to the extreme. I look at the way we build our homes. Stick and concrete is not the, way, the best way to do it. I look at hemp fiber, I look at bamboo, I look at containers. There is a better way to provide housing that's affordable. We seem to be stuck in this mindset that everything has to be built with concrete, it's gotta be built with two by fours, two by sixes. And I told a story there before to some people where I bought, 
I bought 48 board feet of lumber for a project, it cost me $42. I said to the guy, I said, I didn't want treated. He said, that's not treated. And the prices are going up. So when we talk about this concept of affordable housing, to me, affordable housing is, is something that somebody who's making minimum wage can afford a, a good house. But the way we build our stuff now, that is something that's unattainable without subsidies, and that is the wrong way to go about it. I mean, it's great that the government's giving all this money, but it's not sustainable in the long term. We need to look outside the box and say, how can we build homes on the prairies? Because you can do things different in, in, on the coasts, but how do we build them on the, on the prairies with materials that are, are natural, materials that are renewable, and that we can, we can make a house that's affordable, that's energy efficient. And I don't think we've got to that point. And that is something, and I've never and I've never stopped advocating. Um, some of my staff think, geez, Randy's been on the internet again because he's brought in some weird idea. I do that often because I think there's a better way. We just haven't found it. Um, well, I've got to disagree a little bit with my uh, learned colleagues here because uh, affordable housing is very, very high on the uh, municipal agenda, at least in South Creek it is. Um, I just finished the debate uh, with uh, the two that are running against me, um, six uh, co uh, council colleagues and three that want to be councillors and uh, a lot of the questions that were, were pointed towards us at the top is affordable housing. And we knew that 12 years ago when we, uh, when we started working with developers from, uh, from the coast. Uh, six years ago, five, six years ago, when development started to dry up in Alberta, and we started to see interest from, uh, from developers in Alberta, uh, we sat down with them and, and incentives that we gave to developers, it didn't have to come out of our pocket. What we did is we looked at lot availability, and we looked at lot availability that was in existing infrastructure. North of Manitoba Avenue, these 33-foot lots, one pipe comes out to the street. The street is already there. The infrastructure is already there. The sidewalks are already there. And when you do a huge development uh, where you're going to have four or 500 homes come in into a field where you have to build the street, you have to build the sidewalks, you've got to put in the pipe in the ground, the waterworks, all the rest of that, the developers pay for that. In the development agreement, the municipalities, the cities, the towns, the RMs, make the developer pay for that. Our uh, strategy was pointing developers to the downtown port, to where there's availability, the streets are already in, the infrastructure's already in. There's walkability to your downtown. You can bicycle. You can take advantage of all the parks. You don't have to jump in a car every time you want to go somewhere. You can jump on a bicycle and go somewhere. And developers bid. They loved it. And when we were able to do the 33-foot frontage lots, they loved it even more. When we were able to go up instead of sprawl, that's what it's all about. Why do you want to go in undeveloped land all the time? It doesn't make sense. Take a look at what's in our own backyards. We filled up our north of Manitoba. We filled up our downtown core. Sure, we're going to have uh, 100 acres that we're going to develop, but we will do it the right way. But first and foremost, you want to give a developer incentive. He's got to put one pipe coming in from the street to his house, and that's it. And that's where they will save money. All right. I think when it comes down to success uh, for all of us and, and as we build our communities and making them inclusive, we have to treat this as a partnership. It's a, every municipality wants to see success for all their citizens, and it's really about partnership. And so not-for-profits are, are going to engage their municipal officials. It is something that doesn't happen once, it happens over and over and over again, and it helps. you have to build credibility, not only with your plan, but with the people that are involved, and uh, if you have a good plan, and if you have incredible people, and you understand the limitations that municipalities face as well, I think then you're going to see success. Municipalities have significant amounts of infrastructure, and yet out of all the tax dollars you pay, 
we only take in eight cents of every of all those tax dollars. We have limited abilities to make things happen, but we want to partner. And if there's ways that we can, whether it's through uh, whether it's through incentives, small incentives, or uh, development fee forgiveness and other aspects, those are really key things that you're going, that are going to create success for for our communities. And so, if it's treated as a partnership, and if it's treated as a collaboration, uh, you're going to see success. If you're going to have uh, have people, if when it happens to us, when we have people come with their hand out saying we need this, it has to happen. It's a lot tougher, and the relationship probably isn't built. Build those relationships, find those partnerships, you'll see success. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have run out of time. Um, last question, so I guess we were okay. Um, I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for giving your time, not just today, but throughout the year, throughout your term.